talk about a subject that a lot of people don't talk about on the small farm or homestead, and that's land improvement with uh, for sustainable forestry. My background is last I've grown up farming and logging, and done a lot of sustainable forestry work. I work with a lot of farms now, and one of the most neglected things I see on farms, hands down, is the timber resource. People have this mindset in their head that they it's just there, they don't really have to do anything with it, and it's going to be there forever. That's not true. You've got to manage it or you will lose it. So we're going to be looking at, Jay and I are going to be looking at going into this eight acre block of timber here on our property. This has been grazed as cow pasture, so we're going to, there's a lot of damage done. You can graze land, you can graze timber land for silvo pasture if it's done right. With set stocking it, you're going to do some damage to the timber. You're going to see that in here. This is a typical track of upland Appalachian high, uh, hardwoods. Uh, and yes, we pronounce it Appalachia. It's like throwing an apple at you. So this is, this soil is thin, it's shaly, it's rocky. This is a good site location for white oak, beech, and hickory. You're gonna see that there's a lot of red oak in this track. And one thing that you're gonna see is a lot of this red oak is what we call in the timber business, we call it swell budded and doty, which means it's going it's, it's, it's dry rotting from the inside out. And if we don't loot, use this in about three to five years, these large trees that are in here are gonna blow down and you'll already see some in here that are blown down. They're basically gonna be firewood if we don't utilize them now. So what we're gonna be doing, this is gonna, we're gonna walk through here and just show y'all what the timber looks like before we go into it. We're going to log it out ourselves. We're going to use alternative logging practices, low impact techniques. You'll see me using, once we get to part two of this, you'll see me using uh, directional felling and bore cut techniques, a lot of really low impact techniques that give me a lot of directional control so I can maintain, uh, maintain the health of the canopy and whatnot without tearing up my residual stand of timber. We're not going to use conventional logging equipment in here like what I have used a lot of my career. We're going to use farm tractor, which is appropriate to people on homesteads and even farms that are several hundred acres in size. This farm right here is a pretty large farm by, by homestead standards. It's a couple hundred acres in size. The um, You've already got a farm tractor. Most of you have already got a tractor, four-wheel drive tractor. So... Put a forestry winch on the back of it and you're in business. So we're going to go through here. Part one is going to show you site selection, layout, and talk to you some about some basic, very basic things of why I'm going to take certain trees. The long-term goal of this harvest is to increase the quality of timber in this stand, to open the canopy up. I don't want complete, I do not want big holes in the canopy. There's eight acres here. On the international scale, this timber here would cut about 15 to 20,000 board feet to the acre. It's pretty good timber. It's not outstanding timber, but it's a little bit better than average. Um, if you clear cut it, it cut about 20,000 board feet to the acre. We're going to go, so eight acres times 20,000, you're looking at 160,000 board feet in this stand. We're going to go in here and I'm going to take out, and it may vary some, but I'm going to take out probably approximately 30,000 board feet on the international scale. That's going to, this may, it'll really open it up for wildlife. It allows more sunlight to hit the floor, the forest floor, providing more browse and stuff for wildlife. We may fence this and run pastured hogs in here. I may eventually turn this into silvo pasture for cattle. I'm not 100% sure which way I'm going to go with it yet. I'm going to see how this responds. Uh, traditionally, I'll use something like this for pastured hogs. So that's probably what we're going to wind up doing with it. One thing that we're going to talk about real briefly in this is site selection and layout. On this particular site, I don't have any water, so I don't have any stream uh, quality issues or water quality issues. That's one of the biggest things in forestry today is maintaining your water quality. I do not have any streams or surface water anywhere near this site. So the closest thing period to that is about over a quarter of a mile away with a lot of grass for a filter strip. And 
the low volume that we're going to take out is not going to disturb enough soil to even come close to affecting that. We've got everything in place to protect our water quality because that's number one. So if you look at this, where I'm standing right now is the heart of a logging operation. It's called the log landing, or landing for short. All the timber that we harvest is going to be skidded, or we call it skidding in the industry. It's dragging it out by mechanical means to where I'm standing. Then we will turn the trees into logs. After we, we will fall them, limb them, and pop them in the woods, drag the trees tree length to here. Then we will take chainsaws and cut them into logs to properly merchandise them for the sawmill. They will then from there be loaded onto the trucks from here to go to the sawmill. So this is the heart of the operation. And you can see right here I've got a main skid trail laid out. It's laid out central. This is a pretty easy block of timber. This is about as easy general of a site layout as you're going to get, especially here in the mountains. I've got a uh, log landing or a, a main skid trail coming right down through the center of the timber stand. From here, we're going to do a herringbone pattern. We'll have skid, uh, skid trails set at 40, approximately 45 degree angles to this main road coming in here. That allows us to bring the timber down gently, and I will leave trees periodically along that are going to be what's called rub trees, that I know I'm going to damage dragging the other trees out. Those rub trees, as we come out, will be harvested and brought out last to protect the residual stand. So this is just kind of your site layout. We'll now go up into the woods and start to show you why we're selecting what and just show you some of the different species that's in here. You can see looking around, the terrain here is extremely mountainous. The elevation ranges anywhere from 2 to 4,000, 2 to in excess of 4,000 feet elevation above sea level. Uh, it's all upland hardwoods. So this is what we're going to be harvesting our timber with today. This is the second one of this brand that I have owned. I've owned one size larger than this. This is a Typhoon. It's spelled Taj Fun, but pronounced Typhoon. It's a three-point hitch-mounted forestry winch designed from the ground up to work for farm tractors. This particular model is an EGV 55 AHK, which means it's fully hydraulic. Uh, this is a little fancier than most people will need or use on their own woodlot. I manage an enormous amount of timber, so for me, it's what I'm used to, it's what I prefer. The manual ones work superb and are more than which, you know, they're, they're about ideal for an average small homestead or woodlot. The nice features on this particular one, I've got 200 feet of swage cable on here. I've got about 12 and a half thousand pounds of pulling power. These winches are rated in metric tons. So that would be five and a half metric tons of pulling power. Metric ton is 2,200 pounds. Some nice features of this. It's got a chainsaw holder on it. So I've got a good place for my chainsaw. If I've got a larger ax with me, which I normally have on here, I just don't today. I've got an ax holder up here, or you could put a picker room up here. That way I've got something there for beating my wedges. I've got spots on here to hold my chain chokers, which you'll see us use those in a little bit for actually attaching the logs to the winch. I've got multiple spots on here I can hook into. I've got different places I can place the uh, chokers for hanging them to keep them from dangling into the ground. I've got another pulley on here, another rigging point that if I need to lower my center of gravity for a side pull or whatnot, which is not really recommended for a tractor to do hard side pulls. It's tippy, don't really like to do it much, but sometimes you don't really have a choice. This gives me that option of hooking this cable down into here with no tools. Gives me just another point. It's really a nice feature. The manual ones come with that as well, all the way down to the 45 size. They make a 35, 45, 55, 65, and 85 is about as big as you generally see in this country. These are made in Eastern Europe. I've had several different brands of these winches over the years. Um, Typhoon is not the only manufacturer. I've had 
I've owned and or operated several of the other brands. As far as I'm concerned, Typhoon is by far and away the best on the market. Dollar-wise, if you're comparing a manual winch to a manual winch, they're right in the middle of the pack price-wise, but you can, nothing else even comes remotely close quality-wise. Another really nice feature that you have on these is a trailer hitch. So if we're on the real back side of the farm where we can't get the log trucks in and out or we're harvesting our firewood and wanting to bring it out, I can pull a trailer in the woods with me with this hitch right here. I can skid my logs out to my little woods landing, buck them, load them on the trailer, and pull them back to the house instead of having to drag them that far. It keeps my wood cleaner. It does less soil damage because remember, we're after maintaining water quality, so we don't want to disturb any more soil than we have to. We want to leave as light of a footprint as we can. This helps us do that. To my knowledge, none of the other winches offer this. And it's, you can see how easily removable it is so that it's out of your way when you're skidding so you don't tear it up. Some of the other features on here, you've got toolboxes on each side. In this case, I've got extra chain chokers stored in here. Now these are not waterproof toolboxes, so don't put something in there that you don't want to get wet. This is by far and away the easiest three-point hitch implement I've ever used to hook up to a tractor. It's the most well thought out, designed, and engineered piece of equipment. But regardless of what brand you get, if you're going to manage your own timber in a woodlot, and you don't have to have a tractor as big as what we have here today, we've got some pretty big, for homesteading and farming, we've got some pretty good size equipment here because, well, at Cold Springs, we own and lease quite a bit of land and manage a pretty good chunk of land. So we've got some bigger than bigger than bigger equipment than what most of you will probably be running or need. Most of you will be running a compact tractor in the 35 to 40 horsepower bracket, maybe up to 50 horsepower. You could do what we're doing today with that. You're just not going to be dragging whole trees out. You're going to be taking one log at a time. And there's nothing wrong with that. I've done that too. It works extremely well. They make winches that'll fit those tractors. A type uh, EGV 35 would work really well on that. Um, you're just not gonna pull as much as we do in one shot, but if you're not managing as much, time's not as critical for you. That's just the safety aspect of this and the environmental impact reduction by using one of these is significant. Because when I winch the tree, when I winch the tree up to me, it allows me to get the butt up off the ground where I'm not plowing furrows into the ground. So I'm doing far less soil disturbance. Also, if I've got sensitive sites, I don't have to take the tractor down in there. I can sit well outside the area because I've got 200 feet of cable in, on this case. Most winches come with 150 to 160 feet of cable. This one has 200. So I can reach down into some sensitive areas and bring that material up to the tractor where I can then take it out of the woods, thereby reducing environmental impact, potential damage to the tractor, increasing my safety and the safety of anyone working with me. Another big aspect that a lot of people don't think about is what are you going to do when you get a tree hung up? I don't care how good you are, at some point in time you're going to hang one tree into another. Without this it's dangerous to get those down. It's dangerous enough with a winch, but without one, it's really dangerous. With this, I can be away from the tree where it's gonna fall. I can winch it and pull it down to where it's then safe to work on, and I can work it up from there. Some of the other features on this, this, uh, some of the other features that I like, and again, you don't have to have this, but it's handy. Now, I've got a couple of tractors. Every one of my tractors is outfitted with third function on the hydraulics. In other words, I've got third function up front so I can run, I've got a set of wet lines coming to the front. It allows me to operate this root rate grapple. 
This is extremely for handy for working in the woods, handling brush, cleaning up on your farm, period. If you're going to buy and spend the money to have a tractor on your homestead, I implore you and strongly encourage you to have third function installed on your loader. That generally is going to run you about $1,500, not including the grapple. That's just for the hydraulics. That's usually going to run somewhere around that $1,500 mark. It's the best money you'll ever spend. I can do in an hour of cleanup with brush and debris with this grapple what three men would do in an eight hour day. It's a real back and time saver. I happen to have this matched up to a 100 horsepower New Holland. This is a T5050. It's 100 engine horsepower, 85 PTO. This tractor weighs about 13, 14,000, uh, about 13,000 pounds the way I've got it ballasted right now. Um, it's our big tractor here on Cold Springs. We do our heavy work with this. Um, there's some pretty good sized timber in there. I could run this winch on our smaller tractor, but due to the size of the timber on this location, I'm going with the bigger one. The bigger the, uh, the, bigger the timber and the steeper the ground, the more tractor weight you want. It's a safety issue. Folks, you don't want light tractors. There's a lot of tractor brands on the market that they have a high horsepower to weight ratio. That's not a good thing. With a tractor, you want the weight. Otherwise, you don't have the stability and you're just, you're literally spinning your tires. Your horsepower is not gonna accomplish anything without the weight to get the traction. Hey, I'm Ryan. I'm here on Cold Springs Farm. This is part two of the series on timber stand improvement and how to manage your woodlot. We're gonna talk real briefly about some equipment selection and then we're going to go up in the woods and proceed with some felling and whatnot, felling and limbing. So we'll start off with proper protect, personal protection equipment. You want good leather boots to provide ankle support, good traction. When I'm professionally falling timber, this in here lays pretty good, but I'm going to be on and off machinery. So it plays a part in the choice of selection for my boots. On this, you definitely want something with a heel. But these just have regular rubber soles. If I'm falling timber all day long, I prefer my cork boots, as we call them out west. These are spike boots. They're special for logging. They provide absolutely outstanding traction, but they are a pain to get on and off of equipment with. They chew up your rubber floor mats, and you don't get good traction on uh, steel steps with them. Our saws. So this is a little larger timber. A 70 cubic centimeter saw is preferable for the majority of this. 70 to 75 cc's is about ideal for, your, for a heavy working saw for a farm or homestead. At some point we'll go into covering saws and proper saw selection later, but for the purposes of what we're doing today, you'll see that I'll be doing a lot of the felling with this MS440 steel. This is, a, oh, I've had this saw for a good 10 years. It's cut a lot of timber, both from here to the Rockies. Generally, if I'm production falling with a saw, I'll get about two years out of a saw and they're pretty well done. But um, this one, it was my backup saw, so it never saw a whole lot of heavy use at any one time. It's got a 20 inch bar, full chisel chain, half wrap handlebar, which is preferable here in the east. And a little thing I usually put on a lot of my saws, a little rubber key holder so I don't ever have to hunt my key, a saw key. It's always right there. But 70 cc's is about ideal for its, you know, that puts it just a little over five horsepower. That's about ideal for the majority of felling you're going to do back here. Just a good all-around saw. Here I've got my larger saw that I'll be falling some of the bigger timber with. It's a steel MS661 Magnum. It is a 91 cubic centimeter saw, 71 7.1 horsepower. I've got a 24 inch bar with full chisel, full skip chain on here. Just if you're asked, curious. And we'll go into detail on that later. But you'll, I'll do some of my larger felling with this. Even though there's not a tree in there, I couldn't cut with that. It's just personal preference. I do do a lot of bucking with this. I've worn out several of these larger stills that are really good saws. Back to um, personal protective equipment, chaps. This is more of a West Coast style chap. I like them this time of year because they're cool. 
but you can see they're, they're a shorter chap. They go to the top of my leather boots, and that's about where they stop. These right here give you chainsaw protection if you slip. Believe it or not, these, if they're worn properly and taken care of, they actually most likely will prevent you getting cut, even with a saw this big. This is the second largest saw still makes. It's capable of running a 42-inch bar in softwoods. In hardwoods, 24, 28-inch bar is about, about right on it. Chaps will stop one of these big things if you take care of them. When you get these, when you buy your brand new pair of chaps, first thing you need to do is go take them and throw them in the dryer and fluff them up. If the material inside is not fluffy, it won't work. And wash them periodically, but do not use bleach because it'll bleach will break down the protective material inside. When these things start to get oily and nasty, it's time to wash them. Just wash them with a mild detergent or something, but no bleach. And again, fluff them up before you use them. This is a West Coast falling setup. You don't see people back here in the East using them very often. Uh, I used this for years when I was falling timber in the Northern Rockies. It just allows me to carry everything I need right here on me. It's uh, I've got wedges, felling wedges for tipping my trees. I've got a spot where I can carry a, a saw key on me. I can carry a chain sharpener. This is not. This is just a tree counter, not something I really need back here so much. This is an important piece of equipment, an emergency whistle. If you're working with somebody on a machine and whatnot, logging machinery is loud, it's hard to hear. If you need to get their attention for some reason, either you got hurt or you're trying to prevent them from getting hurt or something like that, you have a chance of them hearing you. Shouting, they're not going to hear you. These big pads up here, when you pack a saw, they give me some place to carry that and keep my shoulder from getting cut up. Give me some protection and padding because if you're carrying a saw with a long bar, it's a lot more comfortable way of carrying it. Again, not something you typically see back here. This is not something that you have to have by any stretch of the imagination for managing your own woodlot. If you want it, that's great. Not necessary. The necessary items are the boots, the chaps, grab a hard hat, got a hard hat. Hard hat, mandatory, not optional. The majority of your accidents in the woods come from above as far as serious injuries and fatalities. A lot of your serious injuries come from falls from improper footwear and slipping. I've seen people back here in the east sit there and cut in cowboy boots. That is a disaster. Don't do it. You have no traction. You have no ankle support. It's an accident looking for a time and a place. Something that's absolutely mandatory when falling timber is some plastic falling wedges. These right here, I can take my axe when I'm cutting the trees. Once I've started my back cut, I can tip this into the tree and this will help me directionally follow the tree in the direction I want. It'll keep it from sitting back on my saw. They're plastic for a reason. That way, if you get into them with a saw chain, you don't damage your chain. You're not going to hurt your saw. You're just going to chew the wedge up. I've probably got one that's, there's one that's seen some chewing. I carry two different styles of wedges with me, and this is personal preference. These are just generic wedges from, uh, I think I probably got these from Madsen's Online out of Centrilla, Washington. These I definitely, these are K&H wedges here. These definitely came from Madsen's. I buy them by the dozen. Um, these are a K&H 10 inch triple taper wedge. You've got the initial taper here, more taper here, and then here. These drive really easy and provide a lot of lift. A one inch wedge in the back of a tree will tip a 75 foot tree six feet at the top. That's how much, that's how much you can move one. I like these because they're a little thicker, so if I need a little more lift, I've got it. I generally carry four wedges with me. Um, axe. This is a little two pound Fowler's axe. It's a short handle. 
uh, came from Madsen Supply out of Centrilla, Washington. The, the pads here, those come from Idaho Rigging out of St. Mary's, Idaho. But uh, as do, that's a fire extinguisher holder for working out west on Forest Service land during fire season. This time of year, you're required to carry a fire extinguisher. You won't see me carrying one back here. It's pretty much a non-issue. But um, these right here allow me to beat my wedges. And if my chain does get stuck limbing or topping, I have a chance of hacking myself out real quick. But mostly that's just for beating my wedges into the tree. This is a New Holland E57C excavator. It's the largest mini X that you get from New Holland before going to what they call a midi size. Currently, it's the largest that New Holland makes. You don't need this, folks, for managing your small woodlot. I have this out here simply because we're doing a lot of cleanup. We've got a lot of really invasive species on this farm. In this part of the state of Virginia, we've got a lot of what's called autumn olive. They planted it in the coal on the strip mines Fish and Wildlife planted it years ago as a reclamation project on some of the strip mines in the coal fields, which we're not in the coal fields right here, but we're close. It's extremely invasive. And I use this for cleaning up on the farm because I've got a lot of steep slopes that you can't get on with a tractor. I've got grading projects I've got to do here. I've got, um, I'm getting ready to put in probably close to 10,000 feet of water lines um, to get the cattle out of the streams. So, I do use it some in the woods for building since I've got it. If I didn't have it, I wouldn't lose any sleep over it. So, don't think you have to have one of these. It just happened to be sitting here. <laughs>